Uh, I'm going to speak today about myocardial injury during COVID-19 and um, we'll just bring everybody back a little bit to clinical as we've been right now and uh, to speak that, uh, about the case. A 64-year-old female that came with hypertension and hyperlipidemia, we know today that it's a very big risk factor, but she came this time just with chest pain. Chest pain that are classical, that what we see usually in patients that come in with crushing chest pain. She didn't have any fever, any chills, any kind of other symptoms. And a vital sign was pretty normal. However, immediately we identified the elevated the enzyme level of the heart with a troponin that was 18. In, in women, it's up to 14. And a proBNP that was elevated. This patient received all the cardiac evaluation because this was only the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And as you can see here on this panel, the EKG show ST elevation, something that for us is immediately said that this is a myocardial infarction. And we rushed this patient to the cath lab in order to get a coronary angiogram that you see on panel D. The coronary angiogram did not reveal anything in specific and the chest X-ray did not reveal an pneumonia. However, the echo that you see on panel D showed that this patient had a severe dysfunction of the heart uh, side by side with those EKG changes. The next day, this, uh, this patient was tested to COVID-19 and found to be positive to COVID-19 and eventually developed a myocardial injury due to COVID-19. Uh, we took us 14 days to take care of this patient in the first seven days with a balloon pump, but eventually she survived this hospitalization that did not include any pulmonary manifestation rather than a cardiac manifestation. So what is the COVID-19 and cardiovascular manifestation? There is a, a lot of a way that the virus can affect the heart, but we can lump it into three big groups. One of them is myocardial infarction, as I just demonstrate something that will mimic myocardial infarction. And due to, this due to the hypercoagulability that uh, associated with the disease, it's due to the di direct vascular infection, and of course, the systemic uh, pro-inflammatory stimulation, the cytokine storm that people are talking about. All of those can cause plaque rupture and eventually real myocardial infarction. Side by side with that, we have heart failure that can be developed in a patient with COVID-19. And this is what we are going to focus in the next few minutes about the ability of the heart to be damaged by the virus. Again, is it going to be directed by myocarditis or pro-inflammatory? We're going to discuss a little bit about it soon, but definitely we'll see reduction in the, uh, in the myocardial function. And the last thing that I want to mention there is also arrhythmogenic risk to patients with COVID-19 due to the myocarditis, due to the pro-inflammatory effect or the systemic stimulation, but we see that those patients have much more arrhythmia. So let's nail down a little bit more into the heart failure itself and the myocardial injury. In big, we'll divide the myocardial injury itself into two elements. One element is associated with the cytokine strong increase of the interleukin-6, ferritin, LDH, D-dimer, all those parameters that go up, causing some damage to the heart. But there is still some concern that there is a direct effect of the virus on the heart due to direct inflammation, given the autopsy data from the COVID pandemic for the meanwhile failed to show a, a significant effect associated with this. Before I'm going to our study, I just want to mention one study that came out from China on 416 patients that were affected by the virus. And they identified that 82 patients out of those 416 had a myocardial injury. During this, this study, it was very basic. It was only troponin that was elevated. And they demonstrated that all the disease severity parameters, if it's ARDS, acute kidney injury, hyponatremia, etc. was elevated in patients with cardiac injury compared to patients without. Furthermore, what they demonstrate, the patients that develop elevated troponin, only elevated troponin, have significant increased risk compared to patients without elevated troponin. What make actually myocardial injury in the overall group of patients with COVID-19 a target for us to try to understand what is the role of the myocardial injury on the COVID-19 pandemic? This came out to be uh, one of the key parameters that focus on the outcome of patient side by side with 
age that we all talk about, acute respiratory syndrome, that, uh, the ARDS, and cardiac injury is one of the most important factors. So what we try to do, we try to develop a Columbia a University Medical Center and the CA Center for Advanced Cardiac Care, a, 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 some analysis to understand if we are going to see some more heart failure patient or myocardial injury patient that are going to come our way. But before we look at the long term, we need to understand what's happening right now. We took a cohort of patients from March 1st to April 3rd, one month of patient. We analyzed the demographic, comorbidity, the symptoms. We tried to understand the data according to what we capture from the medical record together with automated abstraction of the data. And we took further cardiology parameters that were available. And the key one of them was electrocardiogram. For us, this is a, like the six vital sign that we are using and all those electrocardiogram are uh, collected during admission were re-read by a board certified electrophysiology to look for any abnormality in rate, rhythm, interval, waveform and tachycardia and first degree AV block. And of course we look for the outcome and we waited for a minimum of 14 days before we can say anything about the outcome. So this was our cohort. During that time, there was 5,500 uh, patients that were uh, examined and uh, across the three hospitals, Columbia, the Allen Pavilion, and the CHUNY. Patients that were positive for COVID-19 was 2,400 patients. And uh, we took only the adults that were admitted, uh, uh, admitted and we had a follow-up of 14 days on them. And this cohort is 1,200 patients. So just to give you some perspective on the disease severity in our institution, 19% of the patient die. Alive on acquired mechanical ventilation was additional 14%. And patients that were alive, admitted, and managed in the emergency department and eventually went home with 67% of the patient. As you can see, there is a lot of patients that are still hospitalized, specifically in the patient that require mechanical ventilation. 75% of them are still uh, remain intubated, and 14% of them are extubated by still in the hospital. Let's understand better this patient cohort. As I said, 1,258 uh, patients. Age, the average age was 61, and it's very clear that if we look at people that were admitted, people that require mechanical ventilation, or people that died, that the older you are, as everybody said, the more the chance that you will be in the bad outcome group. Furthermore, it seems to be that male have a little bit more risk for, de uh, for death or need for mechanical ventilation. Very similar to previous report, cardiovascular risk factor is a risk factor that representing 55% of the patient have hypertension, 36 diabetes, and obesity in 40%, and the worse outcome, the more those Outcome, the uh, risk factor exists. So let's understand a little bit about the EKG. As I said, we reread all those EKG by a board certified electrocardiogram, and we tried to break them into three categories, as I mentioned in the beginning. Any kind of rhythm, rate, abnormality, together with STT changes will be abnormal. We had some borderline EKG that include only tachycardia, for example, and we had some normal EKG. First of all, it's very easy to see that 65% of the patients have abnormal or uh, borderline EKG. And the worse the patient is, the more we see abnormality in their EKG. 82% of the patient die compared to 62% of the patient that need mechanical ventilation compared to only 39%. However, in general, it's very important to notice that abnormal EKG was very common. So what did we find? And what was the abnormality in the EKG? And again, rhythm problem was the most common abnormality. As, as I mentioned before, sinus tachycardia will not call abno, uh, abnormal, will call borderline. It was very common in the patient, as you can see here. However, Atrial fibrillation was much common on the patient who died, and pace rhythm or other kind of rhythm was seen very rarely among our patients. There was no significant differences between the interval that we looked at in the EKG, 
the PR interval that link the atrial to the ventricle, the QRS ventricle, it's the conduction across the ventricle, and of course the QT interval seems to be a little bit elevated. It reads statistical significance, but it's not in a meaningful way. Furthermore, we look at STT changes that look at the depolarization of the left ventricle, and there we saw some significant differences. Abnormal STT changes overall occur in 46% of the patient who die, compared to 41% of the patient in prior mechanical ventilation and only 34% of the, no, the patient that manage uh, medically in, without mechanical ventilation. It's very important to notice that abnormal of STT changes is something that is non-specific and why this depolarization abnormality occurs is still to be determined. So now let's take all of this data and link it to the clinical data. The first thing that we've tried to understand is whether the EKG is really the sixth vital sign. And we tried to link it with two other parameters that we found to be very, very uh, sensitive to detect patient at risk, respiratory rate and the saturation. As you can see here in people where the respiratory rate was below 20 and the auto saturation was above 95, there is still a significant amount of patients that die or require mechanical ventilation, as you can see in the red, 14%. However, if they had abnormal EKG, despite those normal parameters, they have doubled the risk of having the risk for dying or need of mechanical ventilation. Further, no more, in patients that have elevated respiratory rate or a low saturation, again, the EKG doubled the amount of risk, and 46% of those patients require mechanical ventilation or die. Similar to that, we try to understand it with comorbidity that a lot of people talk about. If we had no comorbidity, EKG can double the risk. And patients with abnormal EKG have a mortality or need for mechanical ventilation of 28% compared to 15. And similar, if you have one or more comorbidity, EKG abnormality increase your risk for mortality or need for mechanical ventilation for 43.7% in those cases. Age, again, and other parameters, we can further amplify the uh, sensitivity of detecting sick patients. The older you are, the risk, the bigger the risk is, as I saw in the beginning, but also the older you are, if you have EKG abnormality, it's almost double your risk in the young age group. Doesn't change significantly in the mid-age group that we don't understand why, and significantly increase the risk in the old age group. Again, EKG is another parameter that help us uh, detect it. We all speak about the labs and we ask ourselves whether the EKG is something that is replacing the lab, adaptive to the lab. And as you can see here, our patients are very sick with elevated creatinine, demonstrated renal failure that is going as high as 2.3 in the people who die compared to 1.6 in the people who did not die elevated BUN, 37, and definitely elevated anti pro -BNP, troponin, and D-dimer in the patient that were sicker compared to patients that require only hospitalization. Furthermore, we look at the inflammatory parameters, and all those patients are collected with interleukin-6, SED rate, uh, procalcitonin, and CRP. You have one minute, Nir. Thank you. And as a result of that, we learn that even if we add an EKG on top of all of this, we actually can improve the outcome by, by significantly more and detecting those patients. We further look at the echo parameter of those patients and definitely, and I'm not going to go in detail here, there is a significant reduction in the function of the heart when you have elevated troponin or abnormal EKG. And as a result of that, we can map those patients and learn where they go just by combination of EKG and a vital sign together. I just want to summarize the main finding. 33% of the patient either die or require mechanical ventilation, and 19% of the patient died within 14 days from the disease. This is an admission patient re cohort. Respiratory rate above 20, oxygen saturation below 96, predictive of death and need for mechanical ventilation. An abnormal EKG presenting 63% of the patient and the addition of abnormal EKG to abnormal respiratory rate vital sign identified a group of patients with particularly poor outcome. 
We are now looking to look what is going to this mean for the long-term outcome of COVID-19 patient. And what we're going to see with the development of these EKG changes are going to be here to stay or we're going to see them normalize over time. Or the changes that I uh, spare a little bit with you on the echo are they're going to here to stay, deteriorate or improve. And maybe in the future we'll have some ability to do MRI, functional capacity, and metabolic changes that we usually do in those cardiomyopathy patients, specifically for free fatty acid, glucose, and uh, insulin resistance assessment. So by that, I want to say thank you very much to all the cardiology group that is helping and collecting all this data, and I will be happy to take any question. Uh, thank you, Nir. Um, were there so similar cardiac symptoms in patients with um, SARS-CoV-1 or MERS? And if so, um, what were the long-term outcomes for, for those survivors? Thank you. So this is actually a very important question. So we have some data from the SARS. From the MERS, we, have, uh, we still don't have a report on the long-term outcome. Patient that uh, experienced SARS, uh, again, had a significant myocardial injury side by side with that. On top of it, in an autopsy study from Toronto, 35% of the patient have a viral RNA in the myocardium. So definitely some myocardial injury. They continue to follow the survival uh, for uh, up to 12 years. And they learned that those patients are associated with significant higher risk for metabolic abnormality. Unfortunately, this cohort was very, very small. The SARS epidemic was not as big as this pandemic, but we definitely can, if we get an implication from the SARS-CoV-1 on what we are going to look for, we we'll definitely look for abnormalities and metabolic uh, pa pattern in the cardiomyocyte. And if this is what's going to happen when we have a pandemic that affects millions of people, I'm very concerned that we'll see more and more cardiovascular manifestation because this time with this cohort moving forward, we will be able to answer your question on a big cohort level. But wait and see, that's what uh, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question from Martha Welch. Um, thank you. Uh, you mentioned there was a, a significant difference in people with abnormal QT intervals. Um, are those the patients with sudden death? That have been noticed? So, so again, all those EKG that I demonstrated here is EKG upon admission, meaning before we initiate any kind of therapy. To remind you, so if we want to go to the QTC story we, in relate to hydrochloroquine and azithromycin, usually this is the EKG just before we start those medication. What I mentioned is that there was a statistically significantly but less meaningful changes with prolonged QTC in the, pa in the patient that have a higher mortality compared to not, but this was only 20 milliseconds, 40, 450 compared to 430. So I will not try to make out of it something that is clinically meaningful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nur. 